So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this new International Manifesto Group event, which is also sponsored by the Black Agenda for, uh, uh, sorry, for the Black Alliance for Peace, for, uh, by the No Cold War Campaign, the Tricontinental, and supported also by our media sponsor, the Canada Files. My name is Radhika Desai. I convene the International Manifesto Group. I teach politics here in Winnipeg, which stands on the stolen lands of many indigenous peoples and of the Métis Nation. We are going to discuss why ending US aggression on Cuba is key to world peace and to understand why we need to begin with the long and slow unraveling of US imperial policy and its visible acceleration at this very moment in Afghanistan. Running like a threat through all the presidencies of the so-called post-Cold War world, making them merge into one another as though they were a single one, this unraveling has delivered not unipolarity or a peace dividend, let alone the end of history that so many expected in the early 1990s, but multi and pluripolarity, an unbridled unilateral military, economic, and generally hybrid aggression by the US around the world. This is all the more desperate for its awareness that, uh, of the unraveling, and therefore it has also tended to fail more spectacularly. The, this process culminated in a manner of speaking in Trump's America First policies that replaced the more swaggering forms of US imperial policy in recent decades, such as Clinton's globalization or Bush Jr.'s empire. However, the military industrial complex and the corporate elites who hope against hope to continue projecting US power around the world could hardly disappear overnight. So Trump also transformed Obama's pivot to Asia into a veritable new Cold War on China. The Biden administration inherited the schizophrenic policy. He was elected on a one-point platform to be the anti-Trump. He took office with a one-message mantra, America is back. Six months later, it seems, however, that America is more on the back foot. Forced by economic realities and congressional and electoral realities, all created by the same imperial policies, Biden is continuing so many Trump era policies that his administration is merging into, with, with the previous one into a single Trumpian presidency. Biden had agreed with Trump in, uh, in ending the unpopular forever war uh, and during the campaign itself. And later, it also became clear that he would just carry out Trump's plan, only pushing the deadline back a few months. Biden expected a quick and easy and popular withdrawal, combined with a sweet deal with a puppet Ghani government, whoever remembers his name these days, um, to leave enough personnel there to cause problems for Russia and China. Instead, he has got the most humiliating US route since Saigon possibly more so since the Taliban is a much less attractive force without superpower backing. 40 years of intervention, 20 years of fighting, and what does the US have to show for it? Everybody has been counting the cost, the lives lost, the, the treasure lost, the flood of refugees, the demonstrated failure in nation building, the demonstrated failure to train the Afghan army, loss of respect among allies, the international humiliation. But one element is very critical. It is the greater incoherence of American imperial policy than ever before. The Biden administration says it is withdrawing from Afghanistan so it can concentrate on its more important strategic competition with China and Russia. But has not the withdrawal made them stronger, more secure, and reduced the US ability to create trouble for them? The same combination of decline and desperation, the same incoherence also marks US aggression on the other side of the world. And that is why ending US aggression there against Cuba is also key to ending world peace because that peace is endangered by nothing more than this out of control war machine. Biden promised to go back to Obama era easing in Cuba, but the need to turn Florida democratic and a divided Congress have forced Biden not only to keep hundreds of Trump era sanctions, but to add more of his own. Then came the July protests and Biden leaped at the opportunity he thought they offered. His Afghan policy was already wobbling and Cuba was suffering. Though its world renowned medical system had helped it to face the pandemic with great success, Trump's sanctions 
add, with Biden sanctions added to them and the collapse of tourism were creating serious economic problems. So Biden thought, well, with a little cheerleading, considerable funding, funding and much provocation, he could perhaps turn these protests into an overthrow of communist rule. What could be easier? And what could bring more prestige? Cuba had, after all, been a thorn of a very special sort in the side of US imperial policy for over six decades. It demonstrated the limits of American imperial capacities right at its doorstep, even bringing the prospect of nuclear war there at one point. It was doing so even after losing US Soviet backing in the early 1990s. It was penetrating American domestic politics next to Israel. Perhaps the lobby in Miami is the strongest in American politics. And it was inspiring the rest of Latin America, let alone the world. The Latin America has the proverbial empire's workshop and the backyard of the United States. Now, I'm going to leave it to our panelists to tell you why Biden's ploy is already failing and why Cuba will yet again prove to be the little revolution that could. So let me start by introducing the first of them. We have had to record Iroel Sanchez's contribution. Thanks to the very US sanctions we will discuss, they include denying Cubans access to Zoom. And we should add that our audience in Cuba is joining us through YouTube for the same reason. So let me now introduce Iruel Sanchez. Iruel Sanchez is, um, uh, uh, is, is based in Havana. He has a degree in computer engineering from the Universidad Tecnológica de la Havana, and he is the director of Casa Editora Avril and president of the Cuban Book Institute. From 2000 to 2009, he chaired the organizing committee of the Havana Book Fair. He is the founder of uh, La Hiribila Cultural Journal. He founded the, uh, and coordinates the development of EQRAID, uh, Collaborative Encyclopedia, which is the Cuban version of Wikipedia. He edits La Pupila Insomne, one of the most widely read blogs in Cuba. He's a member of the Cuban Journalists Union as an, and has sat on the International Committee of the World Gathering of Bloggers. He has lectured uh, in Cuba, uh, in Spain, in Brazil and Venezuela, and spoken at uh, international communication and computer science events in Latin America and Europe. He's a regular contributor to Telesur, uh, Al Mayadin, and Russia Today. Um, and he directs the television program La Pupila Ansombrada. So, um, Paul, would you please play the uh, recording that we have of Iroel's um, talk? Muchas gracias, es un placer eh, poder estar en este espacio y poder desde Cuba eh, dar un criterio sobre los últimos acontecimientos en nuestro país. Alrededor del 11 de julio se ha hablado mucho, pero se diría bueno partir de que es, lo que ahí sucedió no es el resultado de procesos eh, inmediatamente cercano, sino de la acumulación en dos direcciones de eh, igualmente procesos que se han venido incubando en la sociedad cubana. Por un lado, el deterioro de las condiciones materiales de existencia de la inmensa mayoría de la población por eh, la interrelación entre dos elementos, el recrudecimiento sin precedentes de la agresión económica por parte del gobierno norteamericano que como es conocido durante el mandato de Trump implementó más de 240 nuevas medidas contra la economía cubana y el impacto de la pandemia que en el caso particular de Cuba vino a eh, prácticamente paralizar uno de los principales renglones de económicos del país que es el turismo eh, y bueno en el caso de estas medidas de dron han ido contra uno de los principales otro de los principales ingresos del país el principal que es la exportación eh, de servicios médicos persiguiéndola por todo el mundo esto ha provocado eh, importantes carencias en tres direcciones fundamentales el abastecimiento de alimentos el abastecimiento de medicamentos en medio de una pandemia y eh, las restricciones para la generación de energía a partir de 
eh, que también se han eh, reducido las importaciones de combustibles, no solo por la disponibilidad de divisas, sino también por eh, la, eh, el encarecimiento a partir de las medidas contra las navieras que transportan ese combustible a Cuba por la política de Estados Unidos. En otra dirección, eh, se ha venido incrementando de modo sostenido el financiamiento para la subversión en el país, ya desde época de Obama. Ah, pudiéramos decir que hay dos grupos de medios de comunicación y de activismos digitales financiados de Estados Unidos, el, pudiéramos decir, eh, de, dirigido específicamente a sectores eh, de gran influencia en la sociedad cubana, a partir de eh, minorías como son intelectuales, académicos, periodistas, artistas, cuya mayoría sigue junto al proceso revolucionario, pero Estados Unidos ha logrado construir una cabeza de playa en esos sectores en Cuba, a partir de publicaciones que tienen, han generado un interés de una microclase atada a ellos, que tiene su modo de vida atada a esos, a esos ingresos provenientes de la subversión. Y por otra parte, los medios de agitación política que eh, crecieron mucho, existían desde antes de la etapa de Obama, pero crecieron mucho en la etapa de, de Trump, que eh, no son, eh, podríamos decir, actuaciones independientes, sino uno generan los estados de provocación para que los otros propongan eh, las soluciones, podríamos llamar pacíficas, ¿no? o académicas, o intelectuales, entre comillas, a lo que los otros generan. ¿no? Eh, la violencia, el, las provocaciones, eso pasó, por ejemplo, con la llamada articulación plebeya, surgida después del fracaso del golpe blando del 27 de noviembre, eh, instigado desde un movimiento llamado Movimiento San Isidro, que como se supo después tenía vínculos directos con la Embajada de los Estados Unidos, el encargado de negocio le hacía de taxista, estaba allí eh, controlando sus movimientos sobre el terreno, etc. Y también conectados con el financiamiento de los Estados Unidos, porque se revelaron eh, contratos con dinero de la NET de más de mil eh, dólares mensuales a alguna de estas eh, personas. También durante la pandemia, por supuesto, se han desactivado las redes eh, estudiantiles, educacionales, ahí el curso escolar está suspendido hace año y medio en Cuba, y en Cuba eso tiene una importancia enorme porque es universal, eh, prácticamente es obligatoria, prácticamente no es obligatoria la enseñanza hasta los nueve grados, y prácticamente todos los jóvenes menores de 18 años están en su inmensa mayoría o estudiando en los niveles de educación media superior, estudiando en la universidad. Y todo eso se desactivó, junto con un deterioro de las redes barriales de organizaciones sociales como la Federación de Mujeres Cubanas, los Comités de Defensa de la Revolución, ese tejido histórico de la revolución que ha venido eh, es reconocido así por el propio por los documentos del propio partido, sufriendo un deterioro en su, en su activismo y también eh, las propias estructuras de los delegados del Poder Popular. Durante este año y medio tampoco ha habido asambleas de rendición de cuentas del Poder Popular que se hacen eh, sistemáticamente cada dos meses para que los ciudadanos ventilen su inquietudes, reclamen soluciones, exijan respuestas, eso también se ha desactivado durante todo este tiempo de pandemia y no ha sido sustituido con otras vías. ¿Con qué ha sido sustituido? Con estas personas que eh, pertenecen a todas estas redes deterioradas o desactivadas, están, sobre todo los jóvenes, cada vez más tiempo en Internet, cada vez más tiempo en las redes sociales digitales, eh, desde las dos, finales de 2018 hay datos móviles en los teléfonos que aceleran todos estos procesos y están sometidas a todo este bombardeo desde lo, los Estados Unidos, financiado a través de todos estos agitadores políticos, todos estos sitios de agitación política. Toda esta eh, combinación junto con eh, algo que el propio gobierno revolucionario, el propio presidente Miguel Díaz Canel, eh, reconoció inmediatamente eh, después del 11 de julio, que es eh, la desactivación de un grupo de programas sociales que Fidel impulsó durante lo que se llamó la batalla de ideas, por, dígase los trabajadores sociales, eh, 
los instructores de arte, eh, los programas de superación para jóvenes, que eh, se impulsaron un grupo de transformaciones económicas, pero estos programas, en medio de esas transformaciones, lejos de ser menos necesarios, son menos necesarios, son más necesarios. Y no se, no se siguieron acometiendo, aunque sí están presentes las atenciones sociales, la seguridad social, siguen eh, estando presentes en las políticas del Estado cubano, esa filosofía de reconectar a los sectores vulnerables con las instituciones y con los programas del socialismo, porque están des en desventaja, hay igualdad de oportunidades, pero no hay igualdad de condiciones en esos sectores para aprovechar esas oportunidades, que fue de lo que Fidel se rescató. Eh, también esta, este bombardeo subversivo, este deterioro de las condiciones materiales de existencia, eh, no se cuenta con esos programas que fueran un atenuante. Pero si bien es cierto todo esto, también eh, esto no sirve para decir lo que ha dicho el presidente norteamericano de que Cuba es un estado fallido, porque precisamente han hecho falta 243 medidas de, restricción, de, de, de restricciones aún más del bloqueo que impuso Trump y que Biden ha mantenido. Ha hecho falta una pandemia que pone a Cuba en, en más desventaja que cualquier otro país del mundo para, para enfrentar y sin embargo Cuba lo ha hecho con uno de los mejores índices, menores índices de letalidad del, del mundo frente a la pandemia y lo ha hecho desarrollando hasta sus propias vacunas para enfrentar y ya tiene tres vacunas certificadas para uso de emergencia y Cuba acaba de, por ejemplo de, de acordar con Vietnam un suministro de vacunas a un país de más de 90 millones de habitantes todo esto indica que a Estados Unidos se le ha ido el tren que cre en que creó montarse el 11 de julio. Y todo esto que vemos después es la retórica para mantener viva uh, y contenta a esa minoría extremista de Miami, que in eh, incapaz de mantener las protestas en Cuba, <risa> las hace en Miami, no sobre el terreno de Cuba, porque ya perdió el, el, la oportunidad, el tren se le fue. Y, y Biden que tiene, con esta fantasía, esta pantomima, de dar internet ficticia libre a los cubanos, que es la misma ficción con que trataron de dar el televisión Martí y han invertido cientos y cientos de millones de estados de, con dinero de los estadounidenses eh, para una televisión que no se ve, lo mismo que va a pasar. Creo que ellos es, están viendo que se les escapa el tiempo, están desesperados, fracasaron en la maniobra internacional, fracasaron en la OEA, fracasaron con sus aliados, solo consiguieron el, el apoyo de 20 países, entre los cuales están eh, grandes violadores de los derechos humanos como Honduras, Colombia, eh, Israel, para una maniobra anticubana. Creo que en toda la línea están eh, desacreditados y frustrados en esta agresión. Lo que le queda es complacer a esta minoría extremista en Miami, y yo creo que estamos asistiendo a, eso sí, una vez más, un intento fallido de derrocar la Revolución Cubana, que todavía tiene muchos desafíos eh, por delante, tiene grandes problemas que enfrentar, pero yo creo que el, la manera en que está actuando hoy el gobierno cubano, yendo a sus bases, eh, eh, dialogando con, con las, y renovando las estructuras sociales, eh, creadas por la, la revolución, movilizando a los jóvenes alrededor de, la, de las soluciones de estos problemas, el camino para enfrentar estas agresiones y también adquiriendo una cultura crítica para comprender a nivel popular todas estas maniobras mediáticas y todos estos procesos eh, de las redes sociales, pero el gobierno cubano no le ha temido a eso. El gobierno cubano después del 11 de julio bajó los precios del acceso a Internet y sus nuevas ofertas. Ese es el gobierno que, de, que Biden dice que le tiene miedo eh, a la Internet. Internet que ellos han eh, limitado para Cuba, incluso impidiéndole conectar a las decenas de cables submarinos que pasan muy, a muy pocas costas de la de la isla y que Cuba tuvo que traer la internet con un cable desde Venezuela por más de mil kilómetros porque Estados Unidos le impidió conectarse a eso. Esas son las verdades, que esta maniobra eh, mediática de guerra psicológica en las redes sociales no quiere que se conozcan. Un saludo eh, a todos y muchas gracias por la invitación y muchas gracias por este espacio para hablar de lo que sucede en Cuba con la verdad. Gracias. Uh, thank you very much to Sánchez for giving us that very measured 
uh, hope, uh, very realistic uh, hope and telling us exactly what makes uh, the Cuban revolution so resilient. Um, okay, so now we will go to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Carlos Ron, and he is the Vice Minister for North America in the Ministry of People's Power for Foreign Relations in Venezuela. And he is also there, the president of the Simon Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity Among Peoples. Carlos was born in Venezuela, and there he has been raised and educated also in Brazil. As a diplomat, he, was, he has represented uh, Venezuela in the United States as well as in Brazil. He was an advisor to the Office of, the Pre uh, of Presidential International Relations, coordinator of the research program on regional integration and multilateral agreements at the Miranda International Center. Um, uh, Carlos has uh, studied at, uh, in the United States and in Brazil. So Carlos, we are very honored to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Radhika, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here. And it's always a pleasure, of course, to, to be somewhere where we can speak out and defend our brothers and sisters of uh, Cuba and the Cuban revolution. Um, you know, it is interesting that you, uh, well, when we gathered under this, uh, for this event, we were talking about um, uh, US aggression being a danger for uh, world peace. And I, I, I would say, you know, it, it, it really the aggression against Cuba is part of a hybrid war that is ongoing already. Um, and then we have to, even though, you know, there's no troops being deployed in Cuba and there's no bombs falling uh, from U.S. planes. Well, we, we have a very uh, a situation that, that is exactly the same as a war and exactly the same uh, with the same capacity of, of creating uh, pain and it's aimed at creating pain and it's aimed specifically at creating a change of government in Cuba, as well as other countries that are undergoing the same type of blockade as we are here in Venezuela and as uh, other countries, about 30% of the world is under some sort of illegal unilateral coercive measure by the United States. This puts into question our, our whole international system where, as we know, only the only, the only actions that we can call sanctions can be issued by the, U, the United Nations Security Council, yet the United States feels that they have the right and that they have uh, uh, the duty to uh, place these actions or these uh, uh, measures on uh, free uh, countries and free peoples, punishing whole populations uh, with uh, the effect of, of their measures. Uh, so we have to keep this in mind. We have to keep in mind uh, that the aggression of the United States against Cuba in recent weeks, as Iroel very well uh, described, uh, you know, uh, has been, we, 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 if we could put a number to it, you know, in the last 16 weeks, there, has been, there have been over 52 U.S. sanctions implemented against Cuba alone. So this is the this is the barbarity, and this is the the mass, the, the you know how massive this attack and this war is uh, is, is actually uh, um, going on against Cuba. Look, I live in a city that, and and and, and with this, I want to say what Cuba means to to me, and I know that it means the same to many Venezuelans. I live in a city that twenty years ago, around twenty years ago, began to change. I could walk across from 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 my street and and begin to listen distinctly hear uh, the Cuban accent next to the uh, National Institute of Sports when we began the, the the cooperation. I could walk further up the hill into one of the poorest neighborhoods here in, in Caracas, and I could also start hearing a Cuban accent for the first time at the post that President Chavez set up. So for the first time in the lives of many of the people that live here, they had access. To uh, to a doctor, they had to, uh, they had a, a, a doctor nearby. Back then, a lot of people uh, who started questioning this uh, this relationship between Venezuela and Cuba began saying, "Why isn't why aren't Venezuelan doctors occupying this post? Why aren't they uh, the ones to take care of the people?" And the reality was that there was a call by the government to for Venezuelan doctors to go and to go into, into the inner city places and to go into the rural, remote rural areas of Venezuela. And they wouldn't go because they said things like, 
you know, those, those, these places are very dangerous. These places are not safe. Uh, we're not going to get paid enough money to do this. I don't want to risk my life for so little money and so forth. And the Cuban doctors militantly and, and with commitment came and gave these people, you know, the, the, the first, the first you know, medical attention they had in years, sometimes in generations. Uh, because there, there, there have been generations that haven't had this access. You know, the irony of this is that those uh, that those Cuban doctors that that, that you know that, that that came to live in these uh, 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 poor areas of the city became the most respected, the most protected people in the area because of the gratitude of the people uh, when uh, the solidarity of the Cuban doctors who who didn't think twice about uh, staying in that part of the city, living with, with, uh, with the population under the conditions that the population was living in those, in those, uh, in those parts of the inner cities. By the way, I saw this in Brazil as well with, with the program uh, Mais Medicos that was implemented under uh, uh, um, uh, the Workers' Party that uh, the right wing supported by the, by the U.S. eventually overthrew. Um, you know, it is... I, I, and, and I'll tell you even more, this unmistakable Cuban accent that we started listening to here, we also heard it in other parts of the country with people that started to read and write for the first time in their lives, thanks to the Cuban brigades that came over and helped uh, uh, um, erase uh, uh, um, literacy from Venezuela by, by alphabetizing over a million people. This, my friends, is not something that you read in a book. Because it's not something you hear in a speech. It's not some report. This is something that we have witnessed here in Venezuela for over 20 years. This is what Cuba means to us. It means humanity. It means solidarity. It is a people whose history is inextricably linked to our own. Cuba was the last mission, the last unfulfilled mission in Bolivar's agenda of liberation for this continent. There's a beautiful flag that I invite you to to look for, created by Bolivarians, of a golden sun on a blue black ground and, and, a, and, a, and a red uh, outline that was supposed to be the flag of the Cuban independence in 1823 and those had those efforts been successful. Cuba has been on the list of priorities for Latin American emancipation ever since 1826. And we finally came to see in an emancipated and free and strong Cuba with the Cuban revolution, uh, with Fidel Castro, he, two weeks after uh, coming to Havana, he came here to Caracas. Uh, and you could read Pablo Neruda's account on, on, on watching uh, Fidel's speech for you know, over 200,000 people here in Caracas and how he said that you know, he had heard something different from a politician, you know, some, some, uh, something that, there, that was lively within uh, the people of Caracas because it, 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 it was to him the opening of a new era for Latin America. That stayed in, the, in generations in the memories of the Venezuelans who have fought very hard during our so-called democracy uh, uh, at that time until it became a real democracy in the Bolivarian Revolution. And, and now we can, we can share the same message that, that, that Fidel gave of solidarity, of coherence, and of dignified living for the majorities of population. What we share with Cuba today is that same horizon of, of social justice. We walk together in a valley of sabotage and aggression and blockades and unilateral measures, all, aid, all aimed at destroying viable socialist experiences as close as 90 miles from the shores of the place that would have you believe that you have reached Dante's neoliberal inferno and, there's, and that we almost abandon hope in, and uh, for a different society. We're not abandoning hope. We are not abandoning Cuba. Cuba to me and, 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 and to most of Venezuelans, it's not only the victorious entry of, of the revolutionaries in Havana, but it's the remarkable achievements of its people, despite all the aggressions that they undergo. Uh, you know, the, like, like uh, Errol said, you know, you have a country who has by now five vaccine candidates of its own, despite all the aggression, despite all the, the limitations that, that it has, yet it doesn't have uh, enough uh, syringes to, uh, to uh, put them on, on, on its own people because of, of, of this uh, uh, attacks that the United States is placing on them. So Cuba is that, Cuba is that resistance, that love, that commitment to a socialist future, which is present in the consciousness of those youth who today 
will come out with their head high and proud and, to, and, and will say to you, we are Fidel, or will say to you, Patria Muerte Venceremos. So this is the Cuba that we defend. This is the Cuba that we stand firmly next to. And we must all do our efforts to denounce this uh, illegal and arbitrary aggression of the United States against all countries that it is trying to uh, destroy and overthrow because we are building a socialist horizon that they are afraid of. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, a very important words, I think, from someone who is on the front lines of fighting American imperialism. I found it very interesting, your statistic, um, uh, the, uh, the statistic that you gave, which is that about 30% of the world's population is suffering under some or the other form of US sanctions. I think that is a very telling statistic. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Chris Hazard. He was a member, the member of the Legislative Assembly of Northern Ireland. Uh, for the South Sudan constituency from April 2012. And then at that time, he was also Minister for Infrastructure in Northern Ireland uh, until from May 2016 till the executive's collapse in January 2017. He's a passionate advocate for rural Ireland um, and, and has been a signatory to the open letter entitled Let Cuba Live, which appeared in the New York Times calling for an end to sanctions on Cuba. Um, Chris, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rodriga, for your kind introduction uh, and to the organizers for the invite to participate in this event today. It's, it's a real privilege to share a panel with some really distinguished speakers here today and political activists here at the forefront of standing up for ordinary people against the imperialist aggression, not just in Cuba, but of course throughout Latin America uh, and indeed across the world. I suppose the fundamental question I want to address in today's discussion is why has the US deployed aggression against Cuba? Uh, others in this panel are much better placed to illustrate how this aggression has manifested across the last six decades. So I, I will certainly give the floor to them on that. Um, secondly, in reference to the title of today's event, I also want to address um, why I believe the US has no interest in world peace, but rather the maintenance of its hegemony as the unipolar superpower of our time. And as a result of this imperialism, many countries will continue to face persistent political meddling, cruel economic sanctions, hybrid warfare, and even outright obliteration. Um, so, so why attack Cuba? Well, quite simply, the Cuban revolution presents an alternative world vision that challenges the hegemony of neoliberal capital system, and there's therefore not acceptable to US imperial interests. As a result, Cuba has endured six decades of relentless hostility including embargo, economic sanction, invasion, occupation of Guantanamo, the fermenting of domestic terrorism, and more than 600 assassination attempts from Fidel Castro. However, it's important to recall that Cuba's revolution was not the Kremlin-inspired communist plot often portrayed in mainstream liberal narratives. Indeed, this is evident if you examine the core message of Fidel's first declaration of Havana in 1960, where concepts such as national sovereignty, democracy and the national self-determination of Latin American countries provided a constant threat. Even Che Guevara was still promoting the need for Cuba to build an economic management system distinct from the Soviet manual of political economy in the mid-1960s. So one of the defining characteristics then of the Cuban Revolutionary Movement was the fact that despite the retrospective application of the communist label, it was in fact a multi-class rejection of the corrupt Batista regime but, but perhaps most importantly, it was a popular uprising against the entrenched inequality, the persistent poverty and endemic racism that existed as a result of the oppressive quasi-colonial relationship with the US. As Helen, who's on this panel here today, has highlighted in her recent work, it's clear from the internal memos from the early 1960s that Cuba was keen to develop trade and investment opportunities with the rest of the world at that time, but the US intimidated and controlled a number of states around the world to ensure that they abandoned any such plan. US President John F. Kennedy then asked his brother Bobby to bring the terrors of the earth to bear on Cuba, as White House memos from both the Kennedy and Johnson era revealed that successive US administrations were deeply concerned in respect of Cuba's, and I quote, successful defiance of US policies and interests in the region dating back to the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. It was feared then that Cuba's successful defiance 
might once again encourage other Latin American people suffering comparable conditions to pursue a similar path of revolution. For that reason, then, success with successive U.S. administrations have been wedded to the belief that it is necessary to punish the Cuban civ civilian population severely until they rise against their own government. And so, for six decades, aggression has reigned. Central to this aggression has been a complex set of economic sanctions and financial embargoes that have been designed and implemented as collective punishment of the Cuban people. A war crime made possible not merely by US military power, but the imperialist construction of a global trade and finance system through US dominated institutions in the wake of Bretton Woods in 1944. In recent decades, we've also seen the deadly consequence of such indiscriminate economic sanctions on the civilian populations in Iraq, and more recently in Iran and Venezuela, as we've just heard. In Iran, Sanctions have undermined the government's ability to purchase many products, including vital medical supplies, which has had huge ramifications for Iran's universal public health system. In Venezuela, Donald Trump stiffened sanctions first imposed by Obama by targeting the Venezuelan oil industry in 2017, causing the loss of $6 billion within the first 12 months alone. Crucially, this loss of hard currency consequently harmed Venezuela's ability to pay for imports like Iran, the impact on medicine imports was especially destructive. In 2013, Venezuela was importing approximately $2 billion in medicines. By 2018, however, that had fallen drastically to just $140 million. The inevitable result of this has been the death of many thousands of Venezuelan citizens. Indeed, as US economist Jeffrey Sachs has illustrated, there was a 31% increase in general mortality in Venezuela in the 17-18 period. That's approximately an additional 40,000 deaths. There's little doubt that these sanctions are the direct cause of many of these deaths, and that numerous high-ranking US officials should today be in jail for murder, as these sanctions are nothing short of crimes against humanity. The ongoing embargo and unilateral sanctions against these countries and their civilian populations, especially in light of COVID, is a war crime. Let's make no mistake about that. Yet, despite repeated warnings from the UN and the International Court of Justice ruling, in 2020 against the US in favor of Iran, the new Joe Biden administration has shown no appetite for loosening the noose. Indeed, as was seen earlier this summer, Biden has introduced a further four sets of sanctions against Cuba, despite his campaign promises to repeal many of the 240 odd sanctions introduced under Donald Trump. And of course, Biden has been able to break his campaign pledges by sticking to the well-established imperialist tactic of inventing a false narrative to justly justify illegal actions for a domestic audience. So where it was first fighting communism, then it was the war on drugs, then we had the war on terror, now we have the new Trojan horse of humanitarianism and human rights. Alan McLeod, in fact, published a striking article earlier this year on how corporate media in particular uses language to encourage elements within the left political spectrum to support imperialist wars and intervention. McLeod identified, one, the plight of women, two, attacking his own people, three, saving democracy and four human rights as the core arguments now advanced by corporate media in the service of imperialist ambitions. Indeed, Libya is a case in point, where a bombing campaign was sold by corporate media in Europe and the US as a necessary humanitarian intervention, yet the attacks obliterated most of Libya's infrastructure and killed more than 10,000 people. What it had, of course, provoked intervention was Gaddafi's long record of the defiant US imperialism in Africa particularly his success in defying U.S. attempts to establish Africa Command headquarters on the continent in 2006. So despite the humanitarian narrative spun by the mainstream media, the primary motivation for the U.S. and NATO to overthrow Gaddafi was the U.S. determination to establish and maintain a military and economic hegemony over Africa. It's worth noting that the HQ for Africa column is still in Stuttgart in Germany, as resistance among African nations has only grown since the Libyan intervention. In Afghanistan too, Despite the dominant narrative, humanitarian concerns were, according to at least one senior British intelligence official from the time, much less significant than other factors. And I quote, the human rights side only became part of the public rationale in order for the government to get the guardian readers of the world on board. And as for the US and their allies being involved in a war for democracy in Afghanistan, they were in fact propping up one of the most corrupt regimes in the world, whose troops and police ruthlessly robbed and pillaged their own people, and whose president only remains in power because of the massive electoral fraud during the 2009 presidential election. Indeed, even ex-CIA director David Petraeus probably identified the key driver recently in an online discussion with NATO's Atlantic Council, 
when he acknowledged that the U.S. were acutely aware that there was approximately $2 trillion worth of minerals in Afghanistan, including lithium, rare earth, and all the other minerals that are in such demand. Finally, I think it's important to look at another campaign promise that President Biden has ignored, that of putting together the most diverse team in history. In fact, he has appointed a decision-making team of mostly professional class people, the great majority of whom are connected to the U.S. photography through participation in leading think tanks, such as the Council on Foreign Relations. There can be no doubt then that we have the U.S. led, once again by an elite who will strive to maintain neoliberalism and U.S. hegemony on the world stage. For those who have never heard of the Council, it is the most important U.S. policy think tank, which has set U.S. grand strategy for over a century and at all times from U.S. imperialism. It is unquestionably the most powerful private organization in the world, the internal hub of U.S. monopoly finance capital, providing a networking and agenda-setting forum for the capitalist class. As Lawrence Shoup has revealed in a recent monthly review article, no less than 17 Biden team members are members of or have close family ties to the council, including Vice President Harris, Secretary of State Blinken, Treasury Secretary Yellen, Climate Envoy John Kerry, CIA, CIA Director William J. Burns, and the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, to name but a few. Since the Second World War, the Council has been vital in setting out the imperial strategy for US involvement in every one of its major wars. Alarmingly, in the last few years, the Council has been setting out an aggressive new strategy towards China, with a recurring theme centering on the need for a, quote, a less cooperative, more confrontational US policy to block China, even if it creates, and I quote again, dangerous circumstances. In other words, it is clear that the Council believes it is now worth risking a catastrophic war to maintain US hegemony. If indeed the Council, and by extension, President Biden's team, or whoever indeed succeeds him, remains focused on global domination at the expense of building a truly multipolar international community, or indeed the urgency of ecological sustainability, there is precious little hope then of world peace as we will slide further into the inevitable collapse of human civilization as we know it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Chris, for really underlining the, the moral repugnance of, of uh, American imperial policy, the institutions that make it and the dangers that it represents. Um, our next speaker is Helen Yaffe. Helen is a senior lecturer um, in economic and social history at the University of Glasgow and visiting fellow at the Latin American and Caribbean Center at the London School of Economics. Cuba and Latin America are her specialties. And since 1995, she spent a lot of time living and researching in Cuba. She's also a founding member of Rock Against the Blockade, a British campaign for solidarity with Cuba. Um, she wrote the book, We Are Cuba, How a Revolutionary People Have Survived in a Post-Soviet World, which was published by Yale University Press in 2020. And previous to that, she wrote Che Guevara, The Economics of Revolution, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2009. Helen, we are eager to hear your words. Thank you very much. Can I start by thanking the organizers and Radhika for the invitation um, and it's a great panel of speakers. Already many important themes have been touched on and I haven't pre-prepared something um, and uh, I'm sort of not quite clear, not, not quite sure the direction I'm going to take this in because there is so much to say. And it's also very difficult to know as someone who's a historian and I teach courses on, on Cuba, um, the, the level of background knowledge and Chris has given us a great history lesson. Um, I totally wanted to pick up on things that Carlos was saying because I was in Venezuela. I went into uh, Barrio 23, one of the poor neighborhoods that he was talking about uh, and saw a, a, a Cuban doctor's surgery. Um, I knew Cuban doctors who left behind their own children to go and serve on internationalist missions in Venezuela and all over the world. So um, I, I want to start by drawing this back to the title of the event, Ending US Aggression on Cuba is key to world peace because um, uh, many of you here will be activists and will know this slogan, no justice, no peace. And of course, a key tenant at the core of the Cuban revolution um, is this demand for social justice, social justice with sovereignty. So the anti-imperial, the deep roots of anti-imperialism 
in the Cuban revolution should never be underestimated and nor should the importance and the pivotal role of the struggle for social justice. And this is actually, as uh, others have outlined, Cuba's great crime, because um, Cuba shows that in order to achieve social justice in underdeveloped countries, and I use that term underdeveloped rather than developing very consciously, countries subjected to hundreds of years of colonialism and then imperialism, in order to uh, attain social justice, they, um, have to take an anti-imperialist position. In other words, they have to um, block the exploitation and oppression that leads to the high standard of living that the uh, majority of populations enjoy in the imperialist countries. And we have to also be clear that we're not just talking about the United States. We're talking about complicity from all the imperialist countries, not just uh, in relation to Cuba, that certainly has been there and the document, fascinating documents are there about the pressure that was applied by the White House, um, by the presidential office in the early 1960s to insist that the British government didn't, for example, go ahead with the sale of Leyland buses and, and help to support uh, the, to, to basically make sanctions effective on Cuba. So that's one thing. The, um, I mean, let's also just, uh, you know, very briefly going back to history. What is the function of sanctions? Now, I've just written a chapter about the sanctions, the history of US sanctions on Cuba for a book called Sanctions as War. And it's actually about the sanctions against, you know, people have been talking about one third of the world has a unilateral sanctions imposed by the United States. So we have to understand these as a weapon of war because when you deny people access to basic uh, resources that they need to live then you are um you, you are targeting civilians and that is certainly the case on cuba what is the function of sanctions now i i've repeated this a few times and in articles but i think it's really important to go back to this key pivotal document written by Lester Mallory, an advisor uh, to the Office of Hemispheric Affairs or whatever it was, um, when they were developing their new po uh, Cuba policy, more than a year before Fidel Castro made the announcement that this is a socialist revolution. More than a year before that, before the mass nas nationalizations, which are used as the pretext and the excuse for why the United States uh, sanctions Cuba. And what he said on the 6th of April 1916, this secret mem memorandum, is we recognize that Fidel has great popularity among the Cuban people. We recognize that the communists are gaining influence. The revolution is moving left. And we can't see any opening to develop an internal opposition. And any attempt to invade or come in from outside will be rejected. In fact, that is what happens. They did go ahead with the Bay of Pigs and the CIA training the, the uh, invaders and so on. But they said, what we need to do is essentially break the link between the population and the government. And we have to do that by using all the measures, economic measures at our disposal to create hardships and suffering he used the word hunger and desperation. Why? In order to attain the ultimate objective overthrow of government, i.e. regime change. And now if we fast forward to the Trump era and the Biden era that we're in now, what we can see is that the 243 actions, sanctions and measures implemented by the Trump administration are a contemporary manifestation of those economic measures. But the other aspect, because this is a two-track policy, create, use economic asphyxiation to create hardship, to um, create frustration, discontent, and at the same time to do everything you can to foster an internal opposition movement. And so the new social media war on Cuba, which is very important that we understand that this is an orchestrated, well-funded, well-oiled campaign. It is a strategy of the regime change programs, that this is the other aspect of the contemporary effort at the two-track policy create economic hardship, 
and foster an internal opposition. So this is what this is about. Um, I want to say something else about the, the question of world peace, and I'm uh, aware that um, I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, when, you know, Carlos was talking about the beneficiaries in Venezuela, as I said, I've seen that. I've been in the barriers myself. But, you know, um, in Venezuela, the Cuban doctors who poured into Venezuela at one point reaching 28,000 uh, medical staff present in Venezuela, that was the first time that many people had noticed Cuban medical internationalism. But let me tell you some incredible things. Other people noticed a little bit later with Ebola in West Africa in 2014, or perhaps earlier when the devastating earthquake happened in, in Haiti with a possibly estimated quarter of a million people killed in the first instance, let alone the consequences of that. But by 2014, we can say, and I'm reading from my book, which has a chapter on Cuban medical internationalism, literally millions of lives have been saved and hundreds of millions of lives improved. That is not an exaggeration. By the Ebola outbreak in 2014, Cuban medical professionals had performed 1.2 billion consultations overseas, attended 2.2 million births and performed over 8 million surgeries. More than 4,000 Cuban medical professionals had um, over half of them doctors were already working in 32 African countries at that time. And some 76,000 Cuban medical personnel had already worked in 39 African countries since the 1960s. So when we talk about peace and the need to, to stop US aggression on Cuba in order to attain peace, we are also talking about the Cuban revolution and what it has done for its investments in, in um, education and healthcare for the rest of the world. The uh, internationalism of the Cuban revolution, which has seen millions of beneficiaries around the world. And even when COVID-19 happened, the rest of the world, I remember, I'm sure you do, the images from Lombardy in Italy when it was the epicenter of the pandemic. And they were saying, where is the European Union? Where is where is our help? Everyone ran away, but the Cubans ran to the epicenter of the pandemic at that point, just as they had done in West Africa and just as they had done in Haiti and are once again doing again with the new scenario in Haiti. So I'll stop there. I hope in the discussion we can focus a little bit on what we can do to combat, if not stop, US aggression against Cuba. Thanks so much, uh, Helen, energizing as usual. Um, our next speaker is Arnold August. Arnold is based in Montreal. He is an author and journalist who has written three books on Cuba, uh, Democracy in Cuba and the 1997-98 elections, Cuba and its neighbors, Democracy in Motion, and Cuba-US relations. And these books have been much praised and much relied on by activists and scholars around the world. Um, Arnold, uh, Arnold has, Arnold's journalism has won a lot of awards and it is published in English, Spanish and French in North and South America, Europe and the Middle East. So Arnold, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Radhika. Um, in our appeal for today's event, we indicate very clearly that we stand against the color revolution or more precisely color counter revolution as an integral part of US aggression against Cuba and thus endangering world peace. Now, uh, I would like to just give one example, my example from Canada about this issue of support for counter revolution. But before saying so, I think it's important to take into account once again, that on July 11th and 12th, there was very important violent activities that took place, uh, plunder, looting, even attacks against uh, state health facilities. This took place on July 11th and 12th. Now, uh, let's uh, get an, one other point. Of course, there are other factors that played into the uh, demonstration. Uh, Errol Sanchez indicated that there are a lot of some confused people who participated. However, 
what I'm saying today, I'd like to concentrate on one specific point on the role, the question of Canada. Now in Canada, we have a very uh, peculiar and uh, unfortunate situation whereby the Canadian dimension that used to be an important voice of the American left in Canada has changed radically over a short period of time lately. Now, they are, for example, on Cuba, which is sort of a litmus test, in my view, whether you're progressive or left or whatever, the Canadian, Canadian dimension has published two articles from Cuban dissidents in their website. So I deal with both of them. Let's deal with one first. It's called La Joven Cuba, which was re reproduced, their article reproduced uh, in Canadian dimension. They say, in the one party model of bureaucratic socialism, of course, the real and spontaneous participation of citizenry in political activity is not allowed. This discriminatory condition explains why, faced with the July 11 social outburst, the party reacted with brutality in an authoritarian way rather than politically. Wait a second. A week after the event, a very important political act took place. Helen was there, she can vote for that, whereby 100,000 people in Havana demonstrated in support of its president and the Cuban revolution and against the counter revolution. Now, this article uh, in La Joven Cuba, published in Canadian Dimension, continues freedom slogans that swept the island indicate the demand of the citizenry to be recognized in a political process that has that that has ignored them up to now. Now, wait a second, where have you guys been? Where's the, the, uh, the Hoven Cuban been since 1959 after the uh, Cuban revolution overthrew a dictatorship, a neo-colonial stranglehold over Cuba and get, began the process of developing real people's democracy, not just where citizens are just recognized, but where citizenry play an active role in their own revolution. Let's go on to their next gem. Se they say several governments and the European Union as a bloc have criticized the violent repression. Now, what were some of the other countries? Well, one of the other countries is Canada. So this puts the um, Canadian dimension in a very difficult situation because in principle, they are very much against the Canadian government, against Trudeau and its foreign policy. But by copying and pasting what the dissidents have to say about Cuba, they open themselves uh, in, in a, they are in a very difficult situation because the, these dissidents, they love the Canadian government. They even more so love Trudeau just as much as they loved Obama before. So let's see what the Canadian government said about July 11 that has so much impressed these dissidents. On July 12, the Canadian Foreign Affairs said, it is closely monitoring the situation in Cuba, concerned by recent events, and urges all sides to exercise restraint and encourages all parties involved in the crisis to engage in peaceful and inclusive dialogue. Okay. July 15, Trudeau said, we're deeply concerned by the violent crackdown on protests by the Cuban regime. Mr. Trudeau, do you not have diplomatic relations with Cuba? Why do you call it suddenly calling it a regime in the same way that Trump and Biden does? Trudeau goes on, we condemn the arrest and repression by authorities of peaceful demonstration. We stand with the people of Cuba who want and deserve democracy, freedom and respect. How nice of Canada. Now, the, on July 23rd, a phone call took place between Canada's foreign minister uh, Marc Garneau and Cuba's foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez. And the, uh, the uh, readout of that event by the Canadian government is as follows. Canada expressed its deep concern over the violent crackdown on protests in Cuba, particularly the repressive measures against peaceful processors, journalists, activists and arbitrary detention. So this is a position of the Canadian government. Now, uh, let us deal with the second uh, important uh, um, dissident group whose article has been uh, published in full by the Canadian dimension. This one is called 
on Cuba. Here's what they say. If after these protests, the government insists that the only way to channel this unrest is through, they put this established channels, in practice, that means that the avenues for handling these conflicts and needs One are minute, Arnold. Sh- One minute. Uh, closed off or unacceptably narrow. So I'll just close by uh, saying uh, this. The other thing that they say is that a social uprising occurs when society is already broken. This is very close to what Biden said, no? Saying that the Cuban state is, the Cuban state is a failed state and the last thing I would like to say, it's important that this, uh, what this uh, dissident group said, that the words vandalism and crit- uh, criminals, these are words used by the Cuban government, have ante- antecedents, for example, with what Chilean President Sebastián Piñera said, who also called people who demonstrated during social uprising as vandals and criminals. So here they are opening up a discussion openly suggesting that Miguel Diaz-Canal is similar to dictators such as in Chile. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Arnold. That was really uh, interesting and absolutely full of uh, very important information. Um, Our next speaker is Fiona Edwards. Fiona is co-founder and member of one of our sponsoring organizations, the organizing committee of the No Cold War campaign. And uh, she's a journalist who focuses on progressive struggles in Latin America. Uh, and on U.S. policy, uh, sorry, on, and on the U.S. Cold War against China. She's also the editor of the Eyes on Latin America website and a national officer of the Stop the War Coalition in the United Kingdom, or in Britain, rather, sorry. Um, Fiona, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Radhika, and it's, it's a great honor to speak today amongst such brilliant company. I'd like to start by congratulating the Federation of Cuban Women who this week celebrated their 61st anniversary. Today, 24,000 Cuban women medical professionals are present in over 40 countries across the world, providing healthcare to those in need during this pandemic. It is amazing to note that the majority of doctors and nurses serving in Cuba's international brigades are women. These women are fulfilling the promise made by Fidel Castro when he said, our country does not drop bombs on other peoples. Our country's tens of thousands Thousands of scientists and doctors have been educated in the idea of saving lives. Doctors, not bombs. Um, It is this spirit of internationalism and global cooperation that humanity needs right now, especially to overcome our common problems. Saving lives by ending this devastating pandemic, making global poverty history, and stopping climate breakdown, which threatens us all. And yet the world's most powerful country, the United States of America, is shunning global cooperation. In defiance of global public opinion, the US is intent on waging a dangerous new Cold War against countries that aren't willing to submit to Washington's diktats. Countries who only wish to exercise their right to determine their own futures and pursue their own path of national independence and development. This is exactly why Cuba is under increasing attack from the US. Just 60 years ago, the Cuban people chose an independent path and refused to submit to US colonial control. Ever since, the US has been intent on overthrowing the Cuban government. So as the US military forces withdraw from Afghanistan, ending the 20 year war on terror, which has killed, injured and displaced millions of people, we cannot say that the US government has drawn any lessons from this defeat or that it regrets the immense human suffering US military military intervention has caused. In fact, the US is becoming more aggressive. In particular, the US is focused on intensifying its Cold War against China, against Cuba, and also against other progressive forces in Latin America who are struggling for national sovereignty and social progress. With an annual military budget of $750 billion, yes, that's annual, and over 800 foreign military bases, 400 of which surround China, the US is moving on from its war on terror and is determined to stop the peaceful rise of China and the development of a multipolar world. Right now, Cuba is the focus of the US's attack in Latin America. And by punishing the Cuban people, the US hopes to send a threatening message to all those who stand up to Washington, that they will also be subjected to a Cold War if they resist the US's demands. The Cuban people understand more than anyone else in the world that the US administration is the greatest threat to world peace and prosperity. For 60 years, Cuba has endured US aggression, as all of the other speakers have outlined, 
It is estimated that the US blockade has cost the Cuban economy over $147 billion. It is absolutely disgraceful that the US, during the global pandemic, chose to make the Cuban people suffer more by tightening its blockade with further sanctions started by President Trump and continued and intensified by President Biden. The inevitable and deliberate consequence of this US aggression has been to produce shortages in vital medical supplies and food in Cuba. So much for this US support for human rights in Cuba. What utter hypocrisy to claim that they support human rights in Cuba. It, it, it is great that the majority of the world is opposed to this behavior from the US. In June, at the UN um, General Assembly, Assembly, 184 countries voted against the US economic blockade of Cuba. Only two countries voted in favor of it. So the US has completely failed to win international support for its attacks on Cuba. And even the US's closest allies have refused to support them. Indeed, in response to the US's latest attempts to destabilize the situation in Cuba, through the waging of an enormous international media campaign of disinformation and the imposition of further sanctions. In response to all of this, people all over the world have mobilized against the US to support Cuba. So Russia, China, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Mexico have all sent practical aid to Cuba. And also there is, a significant, there is some significant support in the US itself against the US aggression against Cuba. Um, in the New York Times, um, over 400 celebrities and organizations, many of them from the US itself, signed an open letter calling on Biden to let Cuba live and end US aggression. For centuries, US has sought to dominate Latin America and the Caribbean, regarding the region as Washington's backyard. And unfortunately, this continues to be the case. However, the US does face major challenges because progressive forces across the continent are pushing forward in their struggle for self-determination. So in Peru, Castillo this year won the presidential election on a promise of using the country's national resources for the people's development. The sovereign and legitimate governments of Venezuela, Nicaragua and Cuba have successfully resisted US attempts to overthrow them against the enormous pressures of economic warfare and campaigns of destabilization. In Bolivia last year, the people overturned a US-backed coup against Eva Morales and the movement towards socialism. And in Brazil, former political prisoner Lula da Silva is free cleared of all the fake charges of corruption that the US organized against him. And Lula now is currently um, having a lead 26% in the opinion polls ahead of next year's crucial uh, presidential election in Brazil. This advance of progressive forces in Latin America is a blow not only to the US foreign policy that designates Latin America as its backyard, but to the US's determination to dominate global affairs. The fact that progressive forces in Latin America are increasingly pursuing win-win relations with China is regarded as very, very threatening development by the US Cold War hawks in Washington. China has become a major training partner for, for most countries in Latin America. The US wants to stop this movement towards a multipolar world. China offers Latin American countries vaccines, trade, investment, and respect for sovereignty. That's the fundamental point, respect for sovereignty. This is a welcome alternative to the US coups, destabilization campaigns, and economic warfare. Just yesterday, it was reported that new supplies to help Cuba fight COVID-19 have been donate, donated and arrived from, from China. What a stark contrast to the US approach of exacerbating the impact of the pandemic deliberately by applying more sanctions. This advance of progressive forces in Latin America and their growing links with China is completely intolerable to the US. And so I, I think that in addition to opposing the US's increasing aggression against Cuba, the world must be alert to the imminent threat of a US-backed coup in Peru the threat of a serious destabilization campaign in Nicaragua ahead of the election in November. And we must be aware high profile figures from the United States, such as Trump's former advisor, Steve Bannon, are already intervening into next year's presidential election in Brazil. They've got plans of, of a soft coup to keep the far right President Jair Bolsonaro in office to stop and to stop Lula from claiming his democratic victory. The US Cold War in Latin America, in other words, is heating up. And Cuba will continue to be on the front line of US attacks. Just a final word. We must support Cuba's right to self-determination, sovereignty and development. Opposing US aggression against Cuba, including all the sanctions and the illegal trade embargo is the best way we can do that. This is not radical. It's simply just and in line with world opinion. It is also key for world peace and the struggle against the new Cold War. Let Cuba live.
Thanks so much, uh, Fiona, for that very fine-grained picture of the balance of forces in Latin America and more broadly as well. It was very informative. Our next speaker is Manolo de los Santos, who is a researcher and political activist. He's worked with, in the Organization of Solidarity and Education programs um, to challenge the U.S. regime of illegal sanctions um, uh, and blockades. Uh, he's also, he was also based in Cuba for some years, and he has been working on building international networks of people's movements and organizations. In 2018, he became a founding direct, the, the founding director of the People's Forum in New York City, a movement incubator for working class communities to build unity across historic lines of division at home and abroad. He also works as a researcher for the Tricontinental Institute uh, and is uh, writes for Glo the Globetrotter and People's Dispatch. Manolo, please go ahead. Thank you, Radhika, for that wonderful introduction. I'm honored to join all of you. It's even a greater honor to be here among some of my own teachers, people who I've studied and read uh, in this ongoing battle in defense of Cuba. I think everyone here has already spoken, I think very clearly to the fact that there is an ongoing war against Cuba. There is a war against Cuba for so many reasons, because it has a socialist project, because it defends its sovereignty and independence, because Cuba in many ways is the base for the dreams and projects of justice around the world. But I would wanna talk more specifically about the fact that this campaign of maximum pressure being waged by the Biden administration right now takes on, if not new characteristics, but uses more openly new weapons in its arsenal. The fact is that at this point, Cuba is now faced not just by economic warfare, which has been in place for close to 60 years now. Cuba is not faced only by the 243 measures imposed by the Trump administration. But there is a full set of war tools being used against Cuba right now that prey on the internal factors, the internal weaknesses and, and issues that Cuba faces every day. Struggles around organizing young people, issues around the internet, race, LGBTQ questions, gender, poverty, all being used to make or create the illusion that Cuba is a failed state. All used to create the idea that somehow in 62 years of revolution, Cuba has made no progress or has not advanced enough. According to the standards of who? I question the hypocrisy of the US government, but of the international sometimes progressive forces who weigh Cuba or put Cuba on a pedestal that it doesn't necessarily need to be on. I actually want to defend Cuba's ongoing potential to achieve full social justice under socialism. I want to defend Cuba's right to make mistakes, to commit mm -hmm. errors. That's right. The right of Cuba to actually live out its full promise of revolution, which means changing everything that must be changed like Fidel often talked about. But recognizing that that is a popular process that has many steps forward as it does backwards. Right now, the ongoing threats around Cuba, so visibly seen on social media, on the internet, will seek to maximize or put greater focus on what seem to be Cuba's great weaknesses. But I celebrate these. I celebrate these because these actually demonstrate the vivaciousness, the resilience of the Cuban people. The fact that, yes, they're struggling to tackle racism. Yes, the fact that they're struggling to end homophobia and transphobia. It's a struggle, a struggle to actually build a different world. And I'm willing to put my life on the line to defend that project. Because at this point, Cuba needs the world, but we need Cuba even more. Where would we be in our own projects of liberation if it wasn't for the Cuban revolution? Where would we be without Cuba as consciousness of the world, constantly reminding us that healthcare is not a privilege, but a human right. Where would we be without Cuba as the lightning rod for new and invigorating projects for socialism around the world? All different, 
in their approaches and their tactics and strategies. In many ways, I would often refer to Cuba as that old home for the Bolsheviks that re-energizes us and pushes us forward in today's struggle. Knowing that so much has been said already in this panel, wonderfully convened, that brings so many voices from around the world, I would only add to that call that says, let Cuba live. But in order for us to let Cuba live, it's not just about stopping or saying we are against the aggression of the US empire, but it's also about building the broadest movement possible of all the necessary forces on the planet willing to stand with Cuba. It often means that we will have to create the strategies that seem impossible in order to make sure that Cuba itself doesn't feel that it's alone, but also to remind the empire, and not just the US, but Canada, Britain, and other leading forces on the planet, that we will not be willing to see Cuba sacrifice on their altar of capital. Just to end, I think about the next book that Vijay Prashad and I are editing, which is a selection of speeches by Fidel Castro in moments of crisis. It's coming out in a few weeks and I hope all of you get a copy, but to me, the one of the things I've learned the most is from editing the book, from rereading Fidel's speaking in those moments in which Cuba was being fiercely attacked militarily, seeing its young people being killed, seeing Cuba face the special period alone in many ways, seeing Cuba have to face the, the dark night of neoliberalism in Latin America, his constant optimism, his constant belief that we will turn all setbacks into victory is what keeps me here standing today with all of you and with Cuba. So I agree with my friends from No Cold War, from all the different organizations that are here, that we will not allow Cuba to be defeated. We will not allow Cuba to continue to be blockaded. We will not allow Cuba to continue to be silenced. We will stand with her always. Let Cuba live. Thank you so much, Manolo. That was very inspiring. And I think you're basically telling us if you really want to support Cuba, you really it's not about just letting Cuba live, but also following the example of Cuba and standing up for our own economic sovereignty, for our own social justice and supporting all those struggles. Thank you very much. So finally, the sort of the dessert on our wonderful eight course intellectual feast will be Camila Escalante's uh, remarks. Uh, Camila is the woman behind the Kawaschen News, a media outlet which is based in Bolivia, and she's also known for her, uh, for her correspondent work around Latin America. Camilla comes from a family of FMLN revolutionary former combatants. She has been based, among other places, in Quito, in Havana, and in Caracas, and she's currently based in Tropico of Cochabamba, and she reports on the campesino movements across the continent. Uh, she will be on the ground recovering the upcoming elections in Nicaragua and in Venezuela. So, Camilla, please take it away. Thanks so much for having me. I wanted to echo what we've already heard from Vice Minister Carlos Ron in Venezuela on the contributions and the presence of Cuban doctors around the world. Here in Bolivia, um, under the leadership of Evo Morales and the mass government, uh, they were able to better the conditions of Bolivians across the board through investment in infrastructure and social programs. But a country without specialized health professionals or with large regions without sufficient doctors can't train or form doctors as quickly as it can build roads. And for many people here, particularly the indigenous communities in areas like the one I'm in, like you said, the Tropico of Cochabamba, um, the Cuban doctors left a massive impression on the people and provided some of the only decent and dignified care people have ever received in their lives. And when we speak to people, they always talk about their experiences uh, receiving medical treatment from the Cuban doctors during their time here. The doctors were expelled during the fascist coup and the right wing doctors associations continue to reject any suggestion of their return because they know that health services become less profitable 
when you have highly trained professionals committed to providing services to the best of their ability, um, under the belief that everybody should be able to access those services without barriers, without discrimination, and who carry the internationalist legacy of Fidel and the revolutionary Cuban people. So I've been covering Cuba in English for a number of years, now primarily for Kausashwa News, and I get a lot of questions about where English speakers can find the best information on Cuba. Our policy here at Kausashwa News has always been to go straight to the source. And so I wanted to share some of those sources quickly. So Cuba Debate has been one of my main sources for full transcripts of important speeches, such as the ones by General Raul Castro and Miguel, uh, President Miguel Diaz-Canel, and many others, uh, many other speeches and discourses um, from Congresses and other key events. Oftentimes you'll find them in Spanish, but you can copy those and of course translate them through free online translators if they're not published in English, or if they're not yet published, translated into English. Granma is the official outlet of the Communist Party of Cuba's Central Committee that has also been key, that uh, has a version in English as well as several other languages. Prensa Latina is the official state news agency of Cuba with a capacity to cover Cuba, Latin America, and the entire world with frequent news articles on its website and which many international outlets and agencies do use. Uh, Telesur English is now being uh, beginning to operate in Havana, where I was based, uh, with Telesur at the start of this year. The Agencia Cubana de Noticias um, is also one of the main uh, uh, state sources that can be a great source for photos, uh, high quality photos of events, which you can find on their social media. There's a project called The Belly of the Beast. It's an outlet based in Havana, and I have had the opportunity to meet with one of its founders this year. And they do more of video and multimedia, which is specifically made for an English speaking audience, a foreign audience, largely on social media. They have a YouTube channel. And last year they released a series called The War on Cuba, which can be found on YouTube. There are many other great sources. Of course, everyone on this panel is a great source for Cuba information, but I'd also like to encourage everyone to locate and follow Cuba's scientific and medical research developments through the official pages of the Finlay Vaccine Institute, BioCuba Pharma, and the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, that's acronym CIGB. There are many others. The Minister of Health is uh, Dr. Francisco Duran. And, um, I would like to hopefully be able to publish uh, such a page on our website, Kansashua News, uh, to be able to share some of those resources so that we don't have to rely on the mainstream press, which has been so misleading uh, for so long on uh, the developments in Cuba because we have such a wealth of information in English and also coming from the United States. We've had some great projects, um, uh, media projects coming from outlets like Breakthrough News, even the People's Forum. These are uh, things that Manolo is involved in, uh, where you can find a lot of information from friends of Cuba and people who have spent a lot of time themselves doing solidarity work on Cuba. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Camilla. We are at the end of our formal presentations and we are about to go into the question and answer session. I really look forward to it. Before we do that, may I please take a minute or two to tell you about an important political initiative that some of us have taken, so those of us in the International Manifesto Group. Uh, we have done what our name implies. We have published a manifesto for our times. Uh, uh, if you like the remarks that were made today, I think you will love the manifesto. So to please take a moment to read it and perhaps sign it. I have ex I have put the um, uh, uh, the URL in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, in the chat, so please take a look at it. Uh, it's basically it's the manifesto is entitled "Through Poly Pluripolarity Towards Socialism," and it basically is is uh, uh, accepts the idea of the critical importance of things like economic sovereignty of national as well as class struggles towards socialism. So. 
please uh, read it, please sign it if you like it, and if you like it, please also circulate more widely to all your friends, comrades, like-minded uh, people and organizations. Thank you very much. So now we will take questions, and in order to take, in order to put a question, please raise your hand using the raise hand uh, function, which is for some people in the uh, reactions uh, 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 little uh, icon is under the reactions icon or you will find it uh, uh, at the bottom in any case of your screen so do i have any questions um i have uh, john mcgrath please go ahead yes uh, thank you uh, i'm an american citizen living in the uk and i've enjoyed this uh, speech to, or the talks today I was wondering if I should put uh, my energy into uh, this um, congressional bill uh, with uh, Amy Klobuchar about uh, ending the economic blockade. I know it doesn't have any language about Guantanamo Bay and that it's uh, drafted by people who are most interested in, uh, you know, selling wheat to Cuba, et cetera. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's not like a, I, I just want to know if you guys think that that, is, that bill has any downsides. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. I think we'll take two or three questions at a time and then uh, open it up to the panel to reply. So I have a second question from Serge Ruski. Serge, please go ahead. Uh, Heather, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on where our esteemed panelists and attendees may be. Um, my question is for MP Hazard, um, but anyone can feel free to add on to this answer. I recently spoke with uh, Cuba's ambassador to Canada, Josefina Vidal, and one of the things we discussed was the ample opportunities for investment in Cuba. With the United States seemingly withdrawing from the global stage, at least on some commitments, is this the right time for the United Kingdom and perhaps other countries? You know, we have His Excellency Mr. Ron from Venezuela joining us as well to pursue closer economic ties with Cuba or at the very, very least reassess them. Thank you. That's great. And I have a third question from Nino Paliccia. Nino, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, amazing uh, panel. Um, for those of us who have been uh, uh, working uh, um, in solidarity with Cuba, this is a very inspiring. Um, I want to uh, refer specifically to um, uh, a message that, that Manolo de los Santos gave us and was in relation to building a strong international uh, movement. And now this is, when we speak uh, about Cuba, uh, we're not speaking only the, 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 uh, uh, against the blockade, the U.S. blockade against Cuba, but we're also speaking against uh, the um, interference, intervention of other countries. Arnold referred to Canada specifically. So when governments deal with Cuba and other countries, that falls usually under the area of foreign policy. Now, in my experience, uh, foreign policy is not necessarily the, uh, at the forefront of uh, people's minds uh, in those uh, countries. So it seems to me that one, our own uh, maximum pressure um, in our own countries has to be in the area of foreign policy. Uh, and that is usually the least important uh, uh, from the people. Now, I would like a, a comment in relation to that and see how, in fact, we can mobilize uh, actions uh, focusing on foreign policy that would address specifically uh, the issue we're talking about, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, etc. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nino. Those are some very important and I think quite practical questions. So uh, who would like to take them first? Uh, I'm going to go to gallery view so I can see among who among the... Uh, Helen, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. I want to address the question of both um, investments in Cuba and um, building, you know, an opposition to US sanctions. So there's a few things to make clear. US sanctions on Cuba are unilateral. They are national laws. However, they massively impact and block 
Cuba's ability to engage with and trade with the rest of the world because of the power of uh, the United States economy and particularly the leverage it has because the US dollar is uh, the dominant currency. So in 2019, this is according to the Wall Street Journal, 88% of transactions were carried out, international transactions were carried out in the US dollar. And the US can uh, prohibit or permit those transactions to take place. So you have this terrible uh, dichotomy where on the one hand, countries like Britain and all, you know, the whole of the European Union have legislation which make it illegal to implement United States sanctions, which are a domestic law in an extraterritorial way. So it is illegal in Britain and the EU to fine individuals or companies for trading with Cuba. Even, you know, we've seen um, that humanitarian medical donations to Cuba in the context of COVID-19 to help Cuba get ventilators and syringes are being blocked, are right now being blocked by US sanctions. Now, the question is, what do we do about it? Because our governments are being negligent. They are not implementing US, uh, their own national uh, legislation to stop this happening, to protect their citizens and entities. Now, I spoke to the EU ambassador um, in Havana a few years ago, and I raised this point. I said there is legislation in the EU from 1996 in response to the illegal extraterritorial nature of the Helms-Burton Act. Why do you not implement that legislation? Why do you allow the US to stop Cuba trading with um, individuals and entities in Europe? And you know, his response was, yes, you're right, we should. We're not implementing our own laws. But the fact is that Cuba counts for 0.8% of EU trade, whereas the United States is, is our dominant trading partner. So I think um, you know, this links to the, the question that you've um, raised, Nina, what can we do? We need very um, radical militant campaigns in our own countries to hold our own politicians and legislature to account. Essentially, if anyone here... For example, I'm in the UK and someone asked about UK investment and um, anyone here uh, knows a corporate lawyer who's prepared to take a case. That's what we need. We need to test these laws. We need to take them through the courts, but we also need to do it while we're building a movement on the streets. Why did Obama go for rapprochement? He went for rapprochement because the heads of state of Latin America, even the right wing ones, had clubbed together and said, we will no longer accept the unilateral uh, um, sanctions and policy of the United States uh, to block Cuba from Latin America. Cuba belongs back into Latin America. And so the political cost to Obama of keeping uh, the status quo was higher for his administration than, um, than moving towards rapprochement. Very little was achieved. There is also a myth that the blockade was lifted. You know, people saying, oh, the blockade's been lifted. No, it wasn't. But the point is that we need to create scenarios in our own countries where the political cost for Britain, for the EU, for the Canadian government of allowing the US to impose illegally its unilateral sanctions is um, higher. It, it, it costs more for them there is a movement to create problems for them than allowing it to carry on in the status quo. So, you know, it is, it is so difficult to do anything with Cuba. I've mentioned sending donations. I'm trying to do a research project with a Cuban partner. And, you know, we got permission from the, the sort of academic side. It's all gone through. But our um, finance office is saying you can't do it because HSBC will not have any transaction with Cuba because it's been put on high risk because Trump maliciously, viciously, in days before he left, uh, put Cuba back on that list of uh, countries that uh, support uh, terrorist sponsors, uh, state sponsors of terrorism. And, you know, we need uh, to hold our governments and our financial institutions to account because this is illegal.
I think that's so important. Thank you, Helen. And it's important uh, both in the case of Cuba as well as in the case of other countries that are being targeted, whether it is Venezuela or China or whatever. And I think what Helen recommends that we have to make it more difficult for our governments to cooperate with the United States is very, very important. Um, other speakers would like to respond to the three questions raised, particularly around Amy Klobuchar's bill and uh, what we should make of it. and. Uh, and also other developments in Latin America. Uh, anyone would like to, to go? Uh, any of the speakers? If I may, I think, you know, at this moment, I, I fully agree with Helen. You know, we have to make it unbearable for all governments, including the US government to continue waging its war on Cuba. In that space, though, in, in the spectrum of what we do, I think all tactics are favorable. All forms of struggle are favorable. I personally don't believe that right now legislative projects in, in the U.S. will advance very much um, to end the blockade or to even limit certain segments of the blockade. But if folks feel they can put pressure in Congress, go ahead. If folks feel that now is there a time and they feel strong about sending aid to Cuba, let's do it. If it's doing open letters, if it's organizing activities, whatever it is, but we must do it. I think part of it is thinking about what Nino was talking about. Often there is a separation of, you know, what we call foreign policy issues from ordinary struggles or everyday struggles. I think we have to end that separation. And sort of that that sort of depends also on expanding what we i would call the friends of cuba group all of us on this call are friends of cuba but cuba needs more than just us as their friends that means expanding that movement and broadening it to include the leading struggles of our moment without asking them to surrender what they talk about or surrender their own agendas but how do we actually bring together the agendas for black liberation with Cuba's struggle against racism? How do we gather the best and the brightest of the fighters for justice around the world and for socialism around the world with Cuba's struggle for justice as well? I think that's sort of the, the need to broaden at this moment. And knowing that not one thing in particular will be the defining factor to end the blockade. But the summation, the accumulation of all these processes and all these forces united in struggle. That's very important. Thank you, uh, Manolo. I think, Chris, you wanted to say something and then Arnold. Yeah, thanks, Rodica. It's just in reply to uh, Serge's question, really, about Ireland. And one of your uh, commentators put into the chat a reminder that, yes, the, the EU's economic trade uh, commissioner, the minute is actually an Irish politician, uh, Maria McGuinness. Um, Ireland's obviously a small nation uh, amongst the, the nations of the world and certainly the EU, but there's an opportunity, I certainly believe, when it comes to the EU um, to be using whatever leverage it has to try and reopen um, some of these discussions again. We've seen it, and it goes back to what Helen Manolo has just said, talking about using whatever leverage you can um, to try, and it is very often in courtrooms and on streets, to be able to open up the advantages. We have seen Irish industry start to do some really good um, deals with China uh, in and around our agricultural and agri-food sectors. Ireland is well known across the world for world-class products whenever it comes to food and agriculture. Um, so th there may well be possibilities there. I know that's certainly something the EU had been looking at previously in different parts of Latin America. But until, as, as Helen has said, until that battle is won when it comes to, to getting around the sanctions, it's very, very difficult to do that. There's also another point in that Ireland is now the only English-speaking uh, member of the EU following Brexit. Uh, it's likely to become a pharmaceutical hub, um, given that the pharmaceutical companies are likely to, to, to relocate out of London in times ahead. That may open up an opportunity around Cuban biotech and biomedical um, opportunities. Who knows? Um, but I say, I, I go back to my comments at the start, until we win that battle um, to open up the trade and alliances um, and to start to reassert some leverage against the United States, it's very, very difficult, especially for a small country like Ireland. Uh, thanks, Chris. And Arnold? 
Yes, uh, with regards to what do we do, I'd like to bring to the attention of, of everyone here that in Canada, there is an important petition uh, by the New Democratic Party <clears throat> member of Parliament, Nikki Ashton, which specifically calls on the Trudeau government to take a stand against the Trump uh, sanctions. So I could send you the uh, links to these uh, uh, petition, this petition, which can be signed uh, by Canadians only. And that is, of course, in addition to that great work that is being done for Let Cuba Live, which is really an international uh, uh, petition. I'd just like to add one point, just in case didn't, people did not see the uh, chat. I put in the chat box the full Errol Sanchez YouTube with the uh, subtitles. So if people missed it through the subtitles, I encourage you to go into the chat box, download it, and you can see his full interview right there. Thank you. Thanks, Arnold. And yes, it will also be on our website later on. So uh, please uh, circulate it. Um, okay, are there any other of the speakers who wanted to respond to that first round of questions? Camilla, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make the, the suggestion and the call and the plea that, um, you know, it's very important that all of us have such a close um, and ongoing and long relationship with Cuba and the Cuban people and all of our solidarity work. And I think it's very important to remember and highlight that young people don't always have these same opportunities because of the precarious nature of people's work, because of how difficult it is to get funding to go on these trips. A lot of times there's a lot of young revolutionaries in places like the United States um, and elsewhere who um, would love the opportunity to be able to visit a place like Cuba. Going to Cuba absolutely for the first time uh, a decade ago changed my life. I was young and uh, very fortunate to be able to be, you know, going to Cuba regularly all the time since then. And I think that um, a lot of times when you go on delegations and you go to these special meetings and things, you see some of the same people. And it is an incredible life changing opportunity to be able to, you know, spend your whole life reading and learning about these struggles, but to be able to go there yourself. And these sorts of opportunities are not available to everyone. And I just think that if we are in any capacity as um, organizations, if you're part of a, you know, a communist party in your own country or some other type of solidarity organization, to always try to prioritize sending some of the youngest people to go as delegates, to go experience uh, for themselves and make those exchanges, have those cultural exchanges and, and that learning experience there in Cuba. And it really does help to, uh, to build and fortify this new generation of, um, of internationalists from a young age. Uh, because as much as we love seeing all of the same people in Cuba you know, every year on May 1st, and all these different uh, events, it's very important to, to give people the opportunity to do that, to make sure that uh, you know, people aren't just solidarity activists over Twitter, that they're able to, to see and experience things for themselves. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we'll go to a next round of questions. I have uh, Tarek Rajiv, please go ahead. Uh, the, the, uh, as a, a former, uh, as a son of a former Algerian fighter for the uh, founder for the movement for the independence of Algeria. We had a close relationship with uh, Fidel Castro and his movement. As a matter of fact, he visited Algeria on several occasions. Uh, my belief is that uh, Cuban people have to be united. All of them have to be united. That it includes the diaspora. So how do you, how does the international movement for the assistance to Cuba uh, manages to relate to these folks in Miami that have been at the base of most of the American policies in the last 60 years because they are frustrated people that left, but now we're talking about a third generation. How can we create a program, establish uh, a movement to change the mind of these people down there so that they can rejoin their own folks, their people against the imperialism of the United States. Thank you, Tarek. And I have Serge has a follow-up follow question. Go ahead, Serge, please. Yeah. Um, 
I'll just follow up on a slightly different topic, but one that I think is very important as well. And I should also take the time to identify myself. I'm uh, the Canadian correspondent with Sputnik News. Um, this is for Mr. Ron. Um, recently, a Canadian outlet, the Canadian Dimension, published an op-ed titled The Lima Group is Falling Apart, in which the author said, and I quote, um, Latin American governments are abandoning the controversial regime change alliance. Now it's time for Canada to follow suit. It is a sentiment that some Canadian parliamentarians have echoed as well. Is it, as you know, Canada is in the midst of an election. Is it time for the next government in Ottawa to reassess relations with Venezuela? And if so, why? Thank you, Serge. So uh, maybe perhaps we will begin with you, Carlos. Uh, I think you're still muted. Sure. Yes, sorry about that. Um, no, uh, look, I think uh, um, the Lima Group is something that should have never even existed. It's something that it's, uh, um, uh, it, it, was, it was purposely created in order to overthrow a government or to promote the destabilization of an entire nation. And as time has gone by and that, that attempt has not been successful to overthrow the Venezuelan government, then what we see is uh, that many of those governments who uh, at the beginning thought they were going to be successful at, at doing so have lost, uh, have even lost themselves their spaces in some of their countries and are now faced with this uh, ridiculous, absurd uh, um, um, position where they try to defend and uphold uh, a government that has no basis in any legal um I mean, it has no, no, no legal basis in, in Venezuelan constitution or in the Venezuelan political system, which is that supposedly uh, parallel government that they established with Juan Guaido. Uh, as negotiations move forward uh, within the Venezuelan government and the different types of oppositions that, that, that we face here, um, what we see is that the, the Guaido-led opposition is even more and more uh, left out and, and left behind. So again, uh, I, I think it's a lesson for everybody throughout the continent that uh, you cannot impose a change of government on Venezuela or on Cuba or on any other where, uh, uh, where there's a popular uh, backing of, uh, of such governments. Uh, our, our, uh, our decisions are, ha have to be made by our peoples. Uh, not by impositions from outside. Uh, the best route for these governments would be to uh, simply recognize what the will of the Venezuelan people is and accept uh, uh, you know, our, our democratic uh, structures. Um, and in practice, whatever they decide to do or not, you, know, you, could, you could tell that by now they lost a lot of ground. Uh, they've lost that effort of using the Lima uh, cartel as a, as a group of pressure against against Venezuela did not work, did not succeed. Uh, today, uh, the white though idea of a government is even more isolated than ever. And as a matter of fact, if you see in the in the dialogue that's going on in Mexico, uh, you know there's there's clearly a document where it says one side is the government of Venezuela and the other side is a unity platform of opposition. So there's no another government of Venezuela. So uh, again, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of resources from the countries uh, re represented in that group. Uh, and it's deemed for failure because you can't overthrow uh, what the people really want for their nations. Great, thank you. Um, any other speakers would like to take up these questions of anti-imperialist solidarity of uh, Helen, please, yes. So just for the first question there about the, um, you know, the situation in uh, with um, Cuban Americans, as they're called, or um, Miami community, I mean, people should be aware that there is a probably unprecedented movement now among uh, Cuban Americans to demand an end to the US blockade or embargo, as they call it, um, and for restoration of like you know, family, the ability of families to send remittances, which is almost impossible now, um, and to visit each other. And um, 
There's, you know, really important work being done by a professor, Carlos Lasso. So check him out, add that to the list of, um, of, of media outlets where you can get information. And they've started to do this thing, which is called the Caravana. So um, I think it's the last Sunday of every month. Uh, people get together in the US. It tends to be in cars. I think in the UK, we've reviewed bicycles <laughs> And to get together monthly and, um, you know, either go on long walks or, or drives and, um, and hold up flags and say, end the US blockade of Cuba. So actually, rather than us trying to influence that community, that, uh, those actions, those mobilizations that have now taken off throughout the United States um, have, have mobilized people around the world so we're now joining in with those activities puentes there more thank you for whoever's just posted that in the chat um and you know th this is also linked to the uh, dozens of organizations around the world including in the united states that are uh, raising money to you know give cuba something back after those statistics that i read how many lives have been saved and improved by cuban medical professionals a result of the revolution's investment in education and healthcare the prioritization of social welfare which as we've been saying is an example the uh, threat of a good example to yeah, neoliberalism yes but let's be honest capitalism and the whole concept of private interest and private accu accumulation of social wealth so there is a movement and we can um, join those that you know those cuban americans are, are brave they are facing attack there is um a, you know unbelievable vicious campaign targeting of anyone who sticks their head out in the united states to call for a change in policy. So uh, we should be uniting with them. And we should also be clear that the predominant um, demand in the United States, not just among the citizens in general, but among Cuban Americans is now for an end to the US sanctions and, and a return to rapprochement, or at least an improvement and a reversal of these very punitive, mean sanctions that the Trump administration introduced and Biden has now augmented. Thanks, Helen. Uh, is that a hand up I see, Arnold? Would you like to say something? Yeah, just in response to Sergio's question with regards to the Lima Group and uh, Carl's, uh, Ron Carl's excellent answer, I'd just like to add that when I saw that news, I tweeted, this is excellent news. It's a victory for the Maduro government and for the Venezuelan people. And the, uh, the at the actual negotiations took place, but it was very disappointing that Canada, who was always supposed to be in favor of a peaceful res uh, resolution, rather than recognizing and just say that's fine, they had to add their own two cents. That is, the, what we need is uh, presidential elections, new elections, democracy, and all that, which is not at all in the memorandum of agreement between Venezuela and the opposite and the opposition. So one other gripe that I have against the Canadian government for which I cannot resist from telling the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnold. Are there any other interventions from the floor or from the speakers? Anyone going once, going twice? Okay, well, I think we can very happily bring this extremely stimulating set of uh, conversations or conversation to a close. I think we've heard a lot about the um, the the vanity, the incoherence, the the the, but at the same time the destructiveness of American imperial policy. And we have heard also about the resilience of Cuba and of other countries fighting American imperialism and how critically important it is to match that with popular struggles around the world. And I think that this is the key message. Once again, let me say that if you like these themes, themes of imperialism and anti-imperialism and of resistance to them, etc., please do take a look at our manifesto. I've just shared, oops, um, one second. Uh, I'm just sharing the um, connect, the link again. Please take a look at that. And for the rest, let me just say thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, I think it's a it's a sign of 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 how meaningful it was what you were saying that we have had so many people still sticking around till the very end. So thank you very much, and uh, please keep an eye on the International Manifesto Group's events and those, of course, of all our sponsors, the No Cold War campaign. 
uh, the Black Agenda for Peace, the Tricontinental, and the Canada Files. Thank you very much, and uh, see you again very soon. Bye-bye.